Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Paul Walton. Um, and thanks to the RSC for the opportunity to speak to you today about seabirds on Scottish islands and their outlook. The first thing I want to say is that Scotland is incredibly important for seabirds. On this slide, the left-hand column shows the proportion of the UK population that breed in Scotland of a range of seabirds. On the, on the right-hand column, that is the proportion of the world population. So we have 60% of the world population of great skewers, half of the world's gannets, a third of the world's Manx shearwaters, a, a, a tenth of the uh, razor bills, uh, guillemots, puffins and kittiwakes. For a small country, this is really quite remarkable. And why is it? Well, it's a product of geology, it's a product of geography and of oceanography. So um, the, the, the igneous volcanic hard rocks of the north and west of Scotland mean we have lots of islands that haven't eroded away over the millennia. And, and seabirds and islands uh, go together very naturally because these birds need places to breed that are free of mammal predators. Um, and often these, these islands are. Uh, and in addition to that, in the satellite image, you can see the seas around Scotland and you can see in this the plankton blooms there. So we are surrounded by incredibly rich seas and those rich seas provide the food that these birds need to feed themselves and to feed their offspring and to breed and thrive successfully. Uh, so it's in, we're incredibly lucky to be perfectly positioned uh, for, a, for a country that is of global significance for these incredible birds. Now in those waters, that plankton we're looking at under the microscope looks like this. This is phytoplankton from the North Sea uh, of, of Scotland. Uh, and this is the base of all marine food chains. And it's the basis of the food chain where, where, of which the seabirds are the top predators. So these plankton, the thing that usually limits them globally speaking, around the world's oceans, is nutrients, and particularly phosphates. And in the seas around Scotland, they are shallow. Uh, and they're shallow and they're exposed to severe weather regularly. Every October, the gales start, and the bottom layers, because they are shallow, get mixed back up. So all the nutrients that fall down because of gravity constantly from the surface layers of the sea get replenished with those nutrients and the phytoplankton can bloom, and they are in turn grazed by zooplankton, like this copepod. And copepods are a key food source for fish, in particular the sand eel. And the sand eel is a highly nutritious, very fatty um, fish, which is perfect food for predators like seabirds. And this short, efficient food chain is a really effective way of getting the sun's energy into a bird. Into, into those top predators. And so we have this incredible sort of global resource in terms of our seabird populations. So Scotland is, is, is very important for seabirds, but also I think it's worth saying, seabirds are, are extremely important for Scotland. So this uh, is a chart from a, a relatively new book. Um, I've got it here. If anyone's interested in birds, I recommend that you buy it. Um, the Archaeology of Wild Birds in Britain and Ireland by Dale Sargentson. And, and, and it's an overview as an osteoarchaeologist who studies birds in particular. And it shows that across archaeological sites in Scotland, right from the Mesolithic through to the late medieval period, um, we're looking at, at the identified bone specimens from all archaeological sites. And what it shows is a, a, a bird that might consider would be a normal food source for, for, for our ancestors, uh, geese. Um, yes, yeah, sure, people ate geese through the past, but actually seabirds are far more common right across uh, history and prehistory in Scotland in terms of, uh, of, of their dietary importance in Scotland. And most of these finds will have been on islands. And let's not forget that the 9.7 billion pounds of income that, that we get in this country from tourism, and that figure, I believe, is from 2016, makes tourism an incredibly important industry to our country today. And if you think these guys are not important in that, think again, because working for the RSPV, I have a lot of first-hand experience of how much people adore our seabirds puffins and all the other species as well. 
So how are these birds doing? Well, we have a national index uh, administered by Nature Scott. Um, it looks at 12 seabird species every year and takes an estimate of their populations. And this is the output um, at the moment. And this has shown between 1986 and 2016, a decline of 49% across those 12 species. This is a huge decline for any long-lived bird uh, looked at over a decadal time period. So just over the past few decades, we've basically lost half of our breeding seabird. Now, this result has been, um, if you like, improved in terms of our knowledge by the seabird count, which is a national seabird census from 2015 to 2021, which actually counted all of the seabirds in the country, not just a sample, um, for, as in the previous uh, slide. And this is the result. So um, the S at the top there stands for Scotland. The seabird species are down the side. The species that are red are in decline. Those that are blue um, are stable or increasing. Uh, the asterisk is the country that has the majority of the UK and Ireland population. You see Scotland, of course, lots of asterisks. For most of the species, we are the most important country for breeding. But look at those reds. Uh, we have 42% decline in, in black plague kitty weight since the last census, 66% decline in the, in the Arctic, 35% decline in fulmers. Most of our seabird species, we know with the very best data available, are in declines, and the declines are very, very significant ones indeed. Okay, that's numbers in a table and uh, and, and graphs and things, but but this, it, it kind of, this is a real thing. And and just to share a bit of personal experience, I spent seven years working for Glasgow University under Professor uh, Pat Monon, who is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, on species like kittiwake. Uh, this is Sumber Head in Shetland, one of our study areas. Um, and on the headland that, that is just before the one that's in the distance, uh, if you look on the top of the cliff, you might just see a tiny black dot. And that little black dot is a hut. It's a hide that I and my colleagues from Glasgow University built in 1989 to study the kittiwake colony, which is on the cliff just down from, down from that site. Um, uh, and we studied them for, for those seven years, uh, hundreds if not thousands of hours spent observing these birds at their colony. And this is the photograph that we used um, to study those birds. Each of the nests where we had one of the pair marked is, is marked in red. And those were our study pairs. We, could, we knew which individuals on the nest at which time we studied their breeding performance, their hatching success, their feeding rate of their chicks, their presence and absences from the nest over those thousands of, of hours. And the project came to an end um, and the results have been published. But I went back to visit this site just a few years ago. And the shed that we built in 1989 is still there. I could hardly believe it with the kind of weather that they have um, in Shetland. But then looking down, this study colony was completely gone. There were no kitty weights breeding there. And I was there in June, which is the height of the seabird breeding season. If you told me that in 1989, I simply wouldn't have believed it. And frankly, it was utterly heartbreaking. These seabird declines are something real, and it's real of cultural significance in Scotland, as well as huge economic and ecological significance. Why? What's happening? If I needed to put my finger on one cause for those kitty weight declines, it would be climate change. This is um, a, a graph of the biomass in the North and East Atlantic of those zooplankton that I showed a picture of earlier. This is, this is copepods. And you can see a big decline from the mid 1950s through to the beginning of this century. And that decline is about 60% in biomass, but also there's a shift in the species composition from the cold water Calanus finmarchicus to the warm water Calanus helgolandicus. And the warm water species is less nutritious. And this is food for sand eels, and the sand eels are, is food for birds. So as top predators, our seabirds are indicators that something is really happening through climate change to our marine ecosystem. And just looking ahead, a more recent result this graph shows under three different climate scenarios, which are the three colors, and what is projected in terms of biomass declines in zooplankton around uh, the, 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 waters around, the waters around Scotland. And you can see these declines are projected to go on even under the most favorable 
climate scenarios. So this climate impacts on the seas, this is a big ecology effect that is affecting the top predators. But there are other impacts as well. We know that human fisheries compete with seabirds for the food that is there. This is a graph from uh, the extraordinary team that worked on the Isle of May for so many years under Mike Harrison, Sarah Wanless. And this shows that sea surface temperature along the bottom there um, in the previous year is related to the breeding success of kittiwakes. And the warmer it was the previous year, the lower the kittiwake breeding success, that slope going down. But it also shows that the top line is a time when there was no sand eel fishery in this area. And the dashed line below it is the is when there was a fishery. So this long-term study has shown there's an effect of climate change, that's the slope going down. But if you add a fishery, it further suppresses kittiwake breeding success. So on top of the effects of climate change, so climate change and fishing affecting food supply for these birds. And then we have some completely unpredictable and novel sources of mentality, like highly pathogenic avian influenza, the bird flu, that hit our seabirds completely unexpectedly in 2021 and 2022, and had a really heavy impact on some of our most important species. And to demonstrate that, just look again at that table from the seabird count. You see the ones that are actually blue that are doing quite well. We've got northern gannet there, we've got the great skewer, we've got sandwich tern. The species that we know from the research that RSPB um, and others have done on the impacts of avian influenza on these birds show that the gannets and the bonxies, the great skewers and sandwich terns are among the worst affected birds. We haven't finished the analysis on exactly what we think the impact on national populations are, but we are sure that these populations will have gone into the red um, as a result of avian influenza. And of course, the seabird census was done before bird flu actually hit. So on top of the seabird census results, bad as they are, we now see that all, all, almost incredibly, the species that were doing best seem to be the ones that have been worst affected by bird flu. So our seabirds are in trouble. They also can be caught as bycatch in human fisheries, particularly on long liners that are fishing, for example, for, for, for hake. And we know that the medium bycatch estimate uh, for the long line fishery from the UK is thousands of fulmers every year. And fulmers, like many other seabirds, are very long lived birds with very slow reproductive rates. When you start to kill adults, they cannot breed fast enough to make up the losses. And we also know that the UK fishery isn't the only one. There's also a Spanish fishery and a French one as well that are probably larger and potentially with a bigger impact on fulmers on top of this off the west of, of, of Britain and Ireland. So we have a major and fairly new source of mortal mortality for adult birds. And we know that invasive non-native species are a big issue for seabirds as well. So this is the Manx Shearwater. Scotland has 34% of the world's population breeding here. They're highly vulnerable to rats. We know from historical analysis that at least 13 whole colonies of Manx Shearwaters have been lost over the past couple of centuries through the human beings introducing non-native mammal predators onto islands. And I'm sure everyone in Orkney will be familiar with the Orkney Native Wildlife Project, hugely challenging work to try to eradicate stoats from the archipelago. This is another species which could potentially have serious impacts on seabirds. And we have offshore renewables developments. Wind turbines can hit birds and can kill birds. They can kill those adult birds when they're out foraging. The estimates of how serious the impact will be vary, but the RSPB is concerned that offshore turbines could be another additional source of adult mortality on already seriously declining and, uh, uh, and pressurised populations. So is the outlook for Scottish seabirds just universally bleak and uh, 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 negative? Well, actually, although the challenges are immense, I am hopeful. And I'm hopeful for a number of reasons. First of all, when you sit back and actually think about what seabirds need, it's actually relatively simple, not easy to deliver, but the basic requirements are quite simple. Seabirds need a safe place to breed that doesn't have mammal predators on it. 
You need enough prey close enough, prey fish, close enough to those breeding sites so that they can feed themselves and their chicks. And they need low or preferably no additional added mortality on those adults. And if those three things are delivered, seabirds will thrive. Let's think about that fishing. Yes, human fisheries definitely have an impact on seabirds, we know know for a fact. But actually, in Scotland, we have a tradition of extremely effective cooperation and collaboration between the fishing industry and conservationists to work for seabirds. And I'd just like to single out the Shetlands Fishermen's Association, who have worked with the RSPB for decades to try to find uh, the best way forward for managing fisheries uh, uh, and to maintain our seabird populations at the same time. And more recently, um, there has been a ban announced by uh, on sand eel fishing in Scottish waters by the Scottish government. Um, now, this has now been challenged by the European Union, and that is an ongoing situation. I can't give you any any updates on it at this stage, but I think this headline in the Herald, a lifeline, still stands. Um, this is an ongoing situation, but the ban has been put in place by by the Scottish government in order to protect this keystone species, the sand eel, and all the other marine life that depends on it. I think it's incredibly progressive. Um, with invasive non-native species, these are the Shant Islands in the Minch between Skye and South Harris. Um, they were invaded by black rats, introduced by people many decades ago. They were having a, a serious impact on the on, on the very important seabird population on those islands and su- suppressing that population, restricting their breeding distribution. The RSPB, together with uh, the, the owners, the Nicholson family uh, uh, and Nature Scott, undertook um, an, an eradication um, of those black rats uh, using volunteers and professionals and RSPB staffers. Um, very intensive piece of work, but I'm very pleased to say that it was successful. And we now have uh, European storm petrels breeding on Shan Islands um, for the first time on, on record. So really an immediate positive outcomes for seabirds. And more than that, the RSPB has also been leading uh, a project around all of the important seabirds islands around the UK trying to prevent these non-native mammals from arriving on those islands in the first place which means you then don't have to spend the millions of pounds required to eradicate them once they establish. And I'm very pleased to say that the Biosecurity for Life project has now finished. It's been very successful, but the Scottish Government and Nature Scott have supported and funded a legacy for that project. So the -the state-of-the-art biosecurity um, equipment and mechanisms that have been put in place for our most important seabird colonies will be continued beyond the end of that European-funded project. So, um, so, so I'm, I'm hugely uh, hopeful that we're moving forward with regard to invasive species as well. And the Shantz Islands, you can see them here now, are now rat free, but they show as an example and also successful projects on Canna and Ailsa Craig and, and some others in Scotland show that we have techniques that we can scale up across the whole Scottish archipelago to give seabirds maximum breeding opportunities that they will need to utilise the food that will be available in future under climate change scenarios. And bird flu, yes, it had a massive impact on our birds, but we have some indication that gannets, for example, that have been exposed to the virus are actually surviving. They have this very strange effect whereby the iris of the eye, which is usually pale blue, darkens. And this is an indicator that this bird has been exposed to the virus and has antibodies to the virus. But we have birds like this who are coming back to breed in their colonies in future years, so they've survived it. And this means that there is a possibility for resistance. But also, I'd just like to thank anyone in the audience who helped uh, responded to the RSPB's appeal that we have ongoing um, to allow us to fund uh, scientists who are working on figuring out a, a better understanding of wildlife disease like highly pathogenic avian influenza, but also trying to figure out how we can develop better contingency plans when these unexpected diseases do hit. And so we have now have a senior conservation scientist, uh, Susie Gold, who has been um, working with government and agencies to develop those better contingency plans in Scotland. On long lining, yes, it's having a serious impact on fulmers, but we know from experience internationally the RSPV is a core part of the Albatross Task Force working in the Southern Hemisphere, Chile, Namibia and other countries to protect albatrosses and other seabirds from being caught 
in longline fisheries, working with the industry. This isn't a bit of advocacy where we say, all oh, this fishing has to stop. We work closely with the industry. We use monitoring to find out what is going on, the levels of bycatch. And then we trial techniques and technologies that will protect the birds and allow the fishery to continue. And this has been hugely successful and is having positive population impacts on some albatross species already in the southern hemisphere. Um, and it's been going now for a couple of decades. And, uh, and I'm confident it will continue into the future and get more success in the future. And in terms of uh, these wind turbines and climate change, what, what I really want to say is that Scotland needs offshore renewables. We need to meet our climate targets. We need to do everything we can to support it. Um, so what we need to do is to figure out the best ways that we can uh, minimise the mortality impact of, of, of the turbines that, that, that need to go in, to site them and design them and position them optimally to avoid seabird impacts, and then hopefully to use some of the revenue from this enormous and important critical industry, and given that climate change is, for example, the number one driver of seabird declines, it's critical that we, that we fulfill our global responsibility here. But if some of the revenue from that can go into some of the conservation mechanisms that I've spoken about in a strategic way, then I think we can deliver real benefits to seabirds. And right now, in development is a Scottish seabird conservation strategy. And RSPB is working very closely with the British Trust for Ornithology, but in particular the Marine Director of the Scottish Government and Nature Scott Marine Ornithologist to design a strategy which will really work for seabirds using the techniques that I've outlined here today. So um, is, is it entirely bleak? It's a very, very serious challenge. Seabirds are in deep trouble. We know that they are prone to extinction. This bird, the great auk, used to breed in Scotland until it was driven to extinction by human exploitation in the middle of the 19th century. But no bird has gone globally extinct. No bird that occurs in Europe has gone globally extinct since the RSPB was started by a group of women in Manchester in 1889. And I'm hopeful that if we use our will and our imagination, we can do the right thing for our seabirds and build their resilience. So thank you very much, RAC, and th thank you to Orkney for being just a fabulous, fabulous place.